Okay, we're now being recorded. Well, good afternoon to this uh, October meeting of the Community Safety Partnership. Uh, my name is Adam Jogi, and I'm one of the co-chairs alongside the Borough Commander, who sends apologies today. So we're joined by uh, Jonathan Waterfield, um, who's substituting for Caroline. Now, please note that this meeting is being recorded for live and subsequent uh, broadcast via the Council's internet site. This reminds me of when I was mayor, when I had to read out that big preamble at four council meetings. Uh, luckily, this is a bit shorter. Um, now, item... Oh, we can hear something. Well, that's a good point to remind folks if they're not speaking to remain on silence, please, or mute, Ewan. And, uh, and you know, to use the, uh, the reaction that you indicate you'd like to speak. Right, apologies for absence. Uh, apologies have been received from uh, Ms Caroline Haynes and Mr Jonathan Waterfield is substituting in her absence. Any other? Any other? Uh, no other apologies? No others. Other, some officers, um, we've got uh, Beverly Tucker and Beverly Hendricks as well. Oh, thank you. I was just Any... going to say that Jude oh. During isn't here as well and I'm just here in her place, Thanks. just as an FYI. Very good, thank you. Um, can we just go out so people can say who's here? That's probably a better idea. So, just, so uh, let me see if we can find. I really hate teams. Okay. Uh, I've got a list of people here. So I'll just say your name if you just can tell us where you're from. So, Anne Graham. Is that me, Councillor Jogi? Anne Graham, Director of Children and Young People Services. Good afternoon, everyone. Greetings. Uh, Marco Bardetti. Hello, it's uh, Marco Bardetti. I'm a Detective Superintendent at North Area, responsible for uh, crime and gangs and serious youth violence. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Marco. Uh, Chantelle. Hi, I'm Chantelle Fatania, Consultant in Public Health. Thank you. Greetings. Councillor Barbazan. Dina Brabazon, Cabinet Member for Children's Schools and Families. Sorry, I was just just having a quick look at the telly. That's fine, Dina, <laughs> don't worry. Uh, Eduardo? Um, Eduardo Arujo, Senior Tottenham Community Safety Manager. Greetings. Uh, Emily? Oh, yeah, Emily Harris, uh, Antisocial Behaviour Coordinator within Tenancy Management. Hubert? Sorry about that. My my team was running really slowly. So Hubert Malcolm, acting director for Environment and Neighbourhood. Thanks, Hubert. Gavin. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Gavin Douglas. I'm the acting assistant director for Stronger and Safer Communities. Thank you, Heather. Hi everyone, I'm Heather Hutchins. I'm the strategic lead for community safety, um, with a focus on hate crime. Great, Rona. Afternoon everyone, Rona Hunt, uh, the Neighbourhoods Inspector for Haringey and Enfield. Greetings, Joe. Uh, good afternoon everybody, Joe Ben Moy, lead on Community Safety and Offender Management for Haringey Council. Thank you, is that Latoya? Your name's not, it's yeah. coming up with Latoya Victim Support. Oh yes, it that is, can't be your phone name, hello. This is Latoya. Hi, I'm Latoya Ridge, Senior Operations Manager for Victim Support London. Greetings. Uh, Naz? Yes. Hello, I'm Naz Gaffrey. I am the clerk to this meeting and I'm the Principal Committee Coordinator for Haringey Council. Thank you. Sandy? Good afternoon. Sandy Broker, Intel Analysis for the Haringey Community Safety Team. Greetings. And Jonathan? Uh, good afternoon, um, Councillor Jogi, um, John the Waterfield, uh, Chief Inspector for Naval Policing um, in Harringay. Yes, and I just saw your uh, your your message in the chat there. I love how so, the police sometimes are so it has its advantages. Yeah. Yes, the police are so much more deferential than politicians. Let me tell you. Um, Far <laughs> more experience and sense from Mr. Waterfield. No offence, Mr. Bardetti. I speak on behalf of both of us. <laughs> I concur. I concur. <clears throat> Very good. Um, OK, great. Well, uh, I'm, I'm Adam, as I said at the beginning. Adam Jogi, the cabinet member uh, responsible for community safety. Now, now, item three, any urgent business? No urgent business, Chair. 
Very good. Any declarations of interest? I guess not, otherwise they would have been indicated. Oh, this is strange. Okay. Fine. Uh, okay. Minutes of the meeting of July the 4th. Are there any comments or thoughts or corrections? <coughs> no? Okay. Uh, well, we can take those as agreed. Is that agreed? Yes, and nodding, thank you. Well, I assume everyone else is nodding too. I can you see Anne now? I don't know what I've done on my screen. Agreed. Cool. Uh, okay, membership. This is just for noting item six, pages seven to eight of the pack. Can we note that, please? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Item seven, the community safety strategy development. Uh, approach. So, Joe, you're introducing this, I believe. Yes, I am chair. Um, I'm going to share my screen um, because my my uh, PowerPoint is slightly different uh, to the to the uh, to that that's in the pack uh, from page nine to 18. And uh, Sandy Broker is also going to present with me. So I'm just going to share the screen. So if you just bear with me a moment while I do this. This is the thing about teams, right? Here we go. And I'll put it on slideshow as well. Hopefully that will help. Actually. OK, is that on slideshow for everyone? Yep, Hopefully, I can yes. see that, Joe. Oh, thank you. I'm going to turn my camera off. Um, OK, so um, we, 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 we thought it'd be good to bring the um, community safety strategy development to uh, this board. Uh, the current strategy uh, expires uh, next year, July 2023, and we are in the process of developing uh, the new strategy. Um, and really, it was just to kind of talk to the board about the uh, process and timelines around that, and and some some uh, some I wouldn't say new developments, but some some other things that we need to consider in terms of how we um, develop the strategy over the next nine months. So I'm just going to bring in Sandy. Thank you, Joe. So, yeah, as, as Joe says, we are due to now refresh the and uh, re, re uh, renew the community strategy, which is due for renewal in in the middle of next year. Um, so, essentially, I'm, I'm sure those will be aware who have been within the community safety partnership for a while now. But essentially, community safety strategy uh, presents our approach uh, as a partnership to uh, our priorities to doing things like reducing crime and social behaviour and disorder across the whole of the borough. Based on this, and really one of the cruxes of this, is the strategic needs assessment, the community safety uh, strategic assessment, which came to the last community safety partnership board and was agreed uh, and signed up essentially by the board at the last meeting. This essentially is an assessment of all of our key priorities and key crime types in order to understand um, what perhaps we want to focus on in terms of the trends, patterns and drivers of crime and social behaviour, essentially allowing us to, to understand what we might want to prioritise with the limited resources that we clearly have. Uh, alongside that, of course, the strategy will, will have to be, an, and a key part of it is that it's informed by a really extensive piece of consultation uh, with the likes of uh, partners both inside the council, but more importantly with our residents, community groups and also businesses, those who have a, a key interest and a key uh, place to play, a key piece to play within the overall shaping of the strategy, because clearly the strategy is, is for the people who live, work uh, and reside all across the borough. As part of this also, there'll be uh, an outcomes framework, essentially an action plan of sorts that will seek to establish that we are uh, hopefully being successful in our aims and objectives within the Community Safety Partnership Board, but also the wider council objectives. Uh, and this will all tie in with the wider uh, council wide plans. Essentially, based on the, the key findings of the strategic needs assessment and based on some of the early discussions that have been had uh, both internally and externally, it does appear that a key priority, some of key priority outcome areas, so some six themes essentially, um, will potentially be the ones shown on screen here. And that cover things such as violence and high harm crime, violence against women and girls, exploitation in all its form, that includes uh, child sexual exploitation, county lines, hate crime, extremism, things of that nature. Quite importantly, public trust and confidence, which we know both locally and also more, more widely across London and nationwide, is a real challenge at the moment. So public trust and confidence clearly is a big part of this. Um, also, additionally, um, I know we've got victim support colleagues on the line, which is great to see. 
producing victims and the repeat victims of crime and social, and social behaviour will be key, as well as obviously the service that, that those uh, victims then receive. And finally, also reducing reoffending. So those are some of the key themes and key outcome areas that potentially will be uh, key parts of the strategy. I'll just hand it back over to Joe, who's going to talk through some of the development timeline. So, so uh, based on you know kind of the initial um, early kind of um, findings and and some of the um, the key themes that we've we've identified, uh, the idea is that these that these will be the anchor, if you like, of our consultation. Um, and, and and in terms of kind of moving this forward, we are currently in the process of, if you like, phase one, where we're looking at our current strategy, uh, looking if it's still fit for purpose. We know that some of the um, outcomes in the in the current strategy are still very relevant. You know, we're still seeing, for example, um, significant violence in the borough. We've seen an increase in in in, in uh, violence against women and girls and feelings of safety at night etc so we're fairly uh, confident in a way that these are some of the key things that that, that, that we'll need to address um but we're, we're also going to look to see if um you know there's any kind of changes needed after you know in terms of um you know the harry go deal for example which i know is in development um and ob obviously from um the agreed police and crime uh, plan and uh, uh, priorities for 2025. Part of this will be to review the action plan and, and the outcomes and outputs and successes against our intended aims. Um, and also in terms of uh, some of the, the, the initial work that we're going to be doing, we're really keen um, as part of the kind of, if you like, in line with the Haringey deal, uh, to involve our uh, residents and community stakeholders in some of these initial uh, discussions about the strategy. And, and this will really involve kind of, um, you know, as you can see on the screen there, police, probation, community groups, um, you know, in-person focus groups, surveys and other digital media, um, you know, to, to try and seek some initial feedback around uh, the, the two following um, uh, questions here uh, in terms of the overview of the strategy. Do people agree with the six themes? Do, they, do, do, do our residents, community stakeholders feel that these meet uh, their expectations? and also to identify key focus areas within those broad themes uh, that are priorities for our communities and stakeholders, which might be different uh, depending upon the issues that they may be experiencing locally. Next slide. Uh, during phase two, which is from February to March uh, next year, we, we will be looking to go to Cabinet to seek approval for formal consultation. Uh, and this will involve a uh, six week formal consultation with the same same groups that, that I've just described, but a bit more in depth uh, conversa uh, conversations with them, listening to, to kind of their concerns, what what really, you know, is 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 are, are issues for them where they live. And the idea around that will be to try to ensure that when we uh, to draft the uh, final strategy that um, it reflects really what we've been told uh, by our residents, by our stakeholders, and that we are really focusing our activities and our limited resources, as Sandeep said, on, on trying to resolve some of those issues. Uh, we'll also look to review that feedback um, once, once all that's back in. Uh, and, and from that, we will look to prepare the draft strategy and action plan. And then we will look to, to hold a, a couple of more engagement sessions with our uh, stakeholders, including this board, uh, with regards to the draft strategy to seek any feedback or additional commentary from you guys and from our, from others uh, uh, before we complete the final version. And then as you can see there, we're looking to take this to cabinet um, uh, to uh, sort of towards the towards May next year, uh, followed by um, uh, their agreement to, to ratify at full council, which we're hoping to do in around June, July, uh, with the publication of the new strategy in July 2023. OK, so I've, I've rattled through that fairly quickly, but the a couple of uh, asks for the Community Safety Partnership Board today are really to get your views on the strategy development process and timeline. And, 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 and just for me to really re-emphasise the importance of that initial engagement that we're looking to do. So as part of that, um, I am uh, working with policy um, I had a series of meetings with them, got another meeting tomorrow where I'm looking to pull together the um, stakeholder map and the stakeholder engagement plan, which should be available um, towards the end of the uh, week of the 4th of November. And this will really set out who, are, who the key stakeholders are, 
in terms of their interest and influence and um and and how we will communicate with them and how often um and what by what means um so hopefully we'll have a, a kind of a better idea really of what that will look like and again because this is initial consultation it's not formal consultation we're looking to um, a, a window of about four weeks um, between mid November and mid December uh, to, to go out and do some of that work. So uh, there'll be some fairly, um, a fairly busy times over really around that. Um, but hopefully by the time we meet again as this uh, at this board, we'll have a, a, you know, we'll maybe have some feedback from some of that initial consultation, which we can bring here. And then the other um, the other bit, as you can see, there is, is really around what I've just said, just kind of um, noting that in, in terms of this strategy, we, we, we are really keen to do that initial engagement. We do want to hear from you guys as well, from, from, from uh, the Community Safety Partnership um, around your views um, and whether you think we're kind of um, um, we're, we're on the right track in terms of what we're looking to do in terms of the new strategy. And I'll leave it there uh, for any questions. I might have to come out of the presentation very quickly. Thank you, Joe. I see Councillor Bowden has her hand up. Zena, do you got a question? And um, um, Zena, you're muted. I was just about to put my hand up, so you saw my <laughs> hand go up before it did. Um, yes, I do have a couple of points. The first one is, um, I know this is just an outline, but I am really, really concerned that any strategy that talks about how we will work with residents, with the police and the local authority and other partners in actually tackling uh, problems in at local level. So if I were to take the most pressing issue that seems to be coming up everywhere, at least it's certainly in my world all the time, which isn't mentioned in your list, although it might slip into ASB, is drug dealing, which is endemic, appears to be endemic, um, in the borough, at least that's what my councillor colleagues say. And I know in our ward, that is just even tops traffic as an issue and is driving people crazy. And I don't know where it fits, but my view, as you know, from my voluminous emails on this point, is that you can't tackle issues like this. The police can't do it on their own. The council has lots of different hats needs to be engaged with the police but that actually needs to be done in part we use the word partnership a lot but i'm i mean working collaboratively with residents and with the traders people who have masses of local intelligence but also having a plan that you look at it you monitor it i've put all this in writing and i must confess to a great deal of frustration that people say yes 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 and they don't move it on i would like to see something like that embedded in a strategy which is about the process of how you work with people when you have limited resources you have to use your brains more when we have and we have to bring in other people's brains um, and I do feel, Chair, sorry if I'm sounding a bit strident on this point, but it's, it's, it's a run. It's been going on for months in my ward. People turning up to meetings, as you, I, the, you know, we have an umbrella group in the ward, over 50 <laughs> people turning up mainly to talk about the, the problems with, with the drug dealing and all that flows from that. And I think we are just missing opportunities in the way we frame our strategy so we can talk about our partners and our stakeholders it's actually how you do it and the process of really listening really working with people and having regular um structure where you can can have a plan and monitor against it like you would in a i mean if i can draw an analogy of a school with an action plan you have to monitor it you have to do the actions that flow from that and i think it's unfair that the police are always getting told off when it isn't really just the police, it is a lot of it is doing us. I, I can answer some of that. So one of the, uh, you're, you're right, Councillor Brothers, on we're really keen to listen to what the concerns are, our residents. So within that kind of violence and high harm offending, we know that drug dealing is linked to violence. So we know there's a, a correlation between the two. And um, so that will be kind of covered off within that. And also don't forget, we are also um, developing our combating drugs partnership which is um, based on the national drug strategy, which will um, um, uh, require local authorities to develop a drug strategy and an action plan around that. 
the community safety strategy will kind of link into those types of strategies, the Herring Deal, the Young People at Risk strategy. So there will be crossover there. And I, I really do take your point around uh, checking in uh, with our residents are, are, is what we're doing working. So certainly within the strategy development, we'll look to build that in because I'm really keen to have those touch points so that we're not we're not just doing things for people, but we're actually working with people. So, yeah, definitely I'll take those on board, Councillor Brethren. Chair, Chair, can I just come back for one moment? I don't know. <coughs> I, I, I think it is about I think this is not just about checking in. This is about a way of working yeah. and it is and you have to be in for the long haul because it, it's quite time consuming and I don't and it whether it works or not, I don't know. But it isn't about just what I think. I'm, I personally find frustration as a councillor is that I go to the same meeting, I go to a meeting every month, 50 people are turning up, the police are there, and we have the same conversation because there's no framework where we move it on. And I just think as a as someone who works as a community worker for a very long time in my work, my work life, I think that there are other ways and we should build that in into the strategy. That's my yeah. suggestion. So we'll see how it how it plays out and let's hear what other people say as you consult the other thing i think consulting in december isn't always the best time particularly when you get beyond about you know the 12th after that people aren't very interested because they're still thinking about christmas or a general election maybe but i don't know well we can only <laughs> hope <laughs> okay. No, yeah, thank you, Councillor. I'll take those points on board. Thank you. Yeah, Joe, I, I was actually going to mention that just going into December and over. So maybe worth looking at the the scheduling of that um, okay. that piece of work to maybe start early in the new year rather than uh, okay. having people. Because that just yeah. cause also when it comes to making sure people are involved and engaged and feeling respected. Actually, if we seem to do it over the summer holiday, over the Christmas period, and you can, as you said, there could be an election that just winds people up rather than carries people with you. Yeah. Which I think has got to be. I don't know. You know the uh, the approach. Okay. Thank you. Any thank other you, points from colleagues? I can't see any hands. Bear in mind, we're here till five o'clock, folks. So you better start talking. <laughs> <laughs> Gavin. <laughs> oh, now you'll start talking. Very good, Gavin. So, <clears throat> I think um, um, bearing in mind what um, Councillor Brambles uh, was articulating, I think it it, it we do have a multidisciplinary uh, uh, multi enforcement uh, meeting once a month called the PPSG, which all partners kind of come to. So I guess the ask is, is about how residents can feed into that that kind of meeting in terms of what uh, uh, in terms of the things that are, are coming up through kind of ward councils. So m maybe that's something we can think about. So we as partners already meet. There was a meeting yesterday where we look at all the um, statistics and crime, um, different partners bring uh, uh, the problems of which they, they think require um, a, a coordinated approach across the different services, uh, which includes the police, you know, adults, children, uh, community safety, ASB, uh, housing, et cetera. Um, so I just want to be mindful that we need to sort of tap into existing existing mm -hmm. uh, uh, ways of doing things, perhaps in a in a in a in a slightly different way. So th those are just my thoughts on that. Thanks, Gavin. Thanks, Gavin. You bit. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Computer today. <laughs> Um, so you know, I, I just want to echo what Councillor Bravazon has said. I think we know that um, some of our street-based violence is driven by drugs. Um, drugs uh, and alcohol is currently in our existing strategy, but I think it's right we talk about how do you really amplify our approach. And below the strategy is an action plan. So an action plan, we can detail exactly what we did. Uh, colleagues, the leader, uh, the Chief Executive and Joe actually met the Commissioner on Friday. And that is one of the points you made, Councillor Bramble, on uh, emphasising what you said about the impact on high harm uh, and violence in the bar um, due to drugs. And I'm sure police colleagues around the table won't disagree with that. But I think you're right. It's about how do we tackle that in partnership, but how do we engender the support of our community as well? So really echoing what you said. But yeah, it's something that you'll definitely uh, focus on going forward. Thank you, Hubert. Thanks, Hubert. I think that's all. OK, well, we're, we're here oh, to know. 
Oh, was, maybe you should have been saying going down. Yeah. Um, uh, okay, so with a couple of those thoughts in uh, in mind, Joe, you'll be able to sort of yeah. keep us in the loop on what that looks like. Will do. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy to colleagues. come back to the next board chair and just give you an update. I think it's in January. Remember yeah, December. no, the next one's December, I think. Yeah, the 13th. Yeah. yeah, I think it's December. Well, I'm away. Anyway, I'm getting married, in fact, on that day. Um, Congratulations. So, <laughs> away for good reason. Um, okay, so uh, we'll just note that. Can colleagues just indicate that their noting's been noted? Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, item eight, zero tolerance for hate. Heather, over to you. Thank you so much, Chair. So I'm just going to share my screen as well because I've altered the presentation ever so slightly. Just bear with me. Yep. Yeah, sorry, it's just loading. Am I? Here we go. We've got a bit of a, a discussion piece at the end, so I'd like to see your faces. So I've just popped it on presenter mode. Um, so this is my sort of presentation around our zero tolerance to hate crime and discrimination on the borough. Um, I'm Heather Hutchins. I'm the strategic lead for community safety. Um, I have a focus on hate crime. The role is fairly new to the borough. Um, I've been in post around two months. However, prior to this, I managed uh, the prevent team. So I do know quite a lot of faces in the room today. Um, one of the key priorities of this role, and as I said, it's fairly new, is to, is to develop and design a hate crime strategy that is co-produced with partners, uh, community contacts and and the residents at the heart. So we are just sort of at the beginning of this journey. We're just kind of thinking about putting pen to paper and starting to think about our partnership approach to tackling hate crime based upon this zero tolerance and what sort of activities will come under that banner. Um, you know, we can all agree that absolutely zero tolerance is very implicit to all of us as sort of colleagues and partners. But what does that actually look like when we break it down? Um, what does it feel like? What are the sorts of activities that will come under zero tolerance? Um, so I'm presenting today some of our initial proposals and suggestions in promoting that zero tolerance. So the ask for the CSP today, I've got a bit of a discussion points at the end of the presentation is around how you can contribute to zero tolerance and whether or not you feel that we have sort of incorporated everything that we can do um, in zero tolerance before we go out to consultation. So kind of just to give a very brief overview of the hate crime definition uh, according to the CPS, um, just to sort of outline the definition, some of the key terms embedded into this definition. So the law recognises five types of hate crime, and this is on the basis of race, uh, religion, disability, sexual orientation and transgender identity. So it's just five key protective characteristics. Any crime can be prosecuted if the offender has either demonstrated hostility based on these five protective characteristics or be motivated or based on these five protective characteristics. So when we think about sort of hostility in the eyes of the law, it can be based on actual or perceived protective characteristics and that word perception there is key. So the offender may incorrectly assume one's identity, but in the eyes of the law, it doesn't matter because the offender has already showed hostility based on what they believe to be correct. This is really sort of important point, particularly when we're delivering training or workshops to professionals, to community leaders in schools. It's all about that perception. If um, the victim, the witness, um, sort of survivor, it could be somebody on the street, it could be a police officer, if they've perceived the event and the incident to be based upon hostility towards that somebody's identity, then it's classified as a hate crime. So. Kind of these are the five suggested uh, approaches uh, on how we're going to deliver a zero tolerance. Um, the approaches are raising awareness, support for survivors and witnesses, building confidence, um, ensuring inclusive reporting and continuous improvement. So using these five approaches, we we do aim to consult with residents and the communities to co-produce a strategy and an adjoining action plan. Today is about kind of getting 
uh, sort of understanding views on these five approaches, identifying any gaps. Think about your role and how you how you can contribute towards the work. So what I'm going to do is kind of break down the approaches, um, kind of go into a little bit more depth around what we mean when we say raising awareness and, and so on and so forth. So raising awareness via training, education, community engagement, and then really honing in on weeks and months of action, for example, Hate Crime Awareness Week. So in terms of our training and education, we would want to sort of like deploy this around professionals, communities, schools, um, kind of faith leads, all those key community leaders. Training is obviously, as everyone can kind of appreciate, it's really fundamental in our efforts to sort of educate people on the support that's available to them and how to report to get that uptick in reporting. We want to ensure that sort of our key, when we think about training, we really want to ensure that our key audience have a real good understanding of hate crime, the differences between hate crime and a hate incident, uh, what support is available locally and how to report. Um, in terms of education, um, and again, we've delivered, um, we've kind of designed, developed and delivered on a package of education right from key stage um, to up to um, secondary school age and um, senior school. Um, the, the aims of these sort of uh, education packages is to give young people the skills to recognise hate crime and understand what support is available to them. Um, again, kind of running in tandem, we have, one of the key outcomes is to build resilience in young people so they feel really equipped to recognise when something doesn't feel right or there's an attack on their identity and to be able to counter hate and report or talk to somebody um, when they see some things happening. Um, again, these resources have been made available um, to all uh, educational um, you know, um, institutions as well as out of school settings, because obviously that's equally as important as statutory education. In terms of uh, community engagement, um, we want to kind of encompass um, all forms of communities, businesses, residents, key community groups, leaders and even colleague engagement um, via staff networks. Um, we know that obviously our communities are the eyes and ears. They know what's going on um, on the ground and they're able to probably help us understand some of the drivers and motivators behind hate crime so we can effectively sort of target our resources and raise awareness to the different, uh, to the most key sort of vulnerable groups. Um, and this is just some of examples of how we've raised awareness. Uh, last week it was Hate Crime Awareness Week. Um, it was really imperative that we use this week as a platform to showcase some of the work that we're doing um, surrounding hate crime, um, including education and kind of uh, advocating on behalf of uh, victims. Uh, and that's just some of the examples of, of what we've done last week. Um, another one of our sort of key approaches, our second key approach is having um, a real succinct sort of support for witnesses, survivors and perpetrators. Um, of hate crime and one of the ways that we propose to do this um, is to support people uh, via the development of a victims project. Um, so this victims project is, is currently in action. Um, the project is a cross departmental partnership between ourselves in community safety and connected communities local area coordinators. Um, the partnership, uh, the project offers strength based and person centred support. It's all about listening um, in a non biased and judgmental way. And we don't necessarily have any aims of the project. Our aim is um, relationship is the intervention. So that's that's kind of it's all about relationship building and it's all about um, allowing sort of victims to achieve their vision of a good life. Um, it's been running for about four months now and um, we've just took on a new referral today, which is fantastic. It came from some of the training that we did during Hate Crime Awareness Week. One of the antisocial behaviour officers has referred in a case to us. Um, so we're going to be contacting um, the victims of that case um, this week. Um, so it shows that, you know, kind of the training is imperative to kind of support our services and support our victims. In terms of um, building confidence, this is another key approach as we know that hate crime is really underreported by about 60 to 80%. Um, so we want to know why that is. Um, 
is it a lack of confidence that something's going to get done or is it that people don't feel like um, the authorities will take something seriously or they don't quite have the skills to be able to um, sort of manage their identity so we really want to understand the why and then in turn we want to show residents um, that we do care and that we are listening so we want to feel more informed about how residents feel about reporting hate crime and their perception on how the council and police deal with it based upon their past um, experiences uh, and then in turn we want residents to feel a lot more informed on what we're doing and we want them to know that we do care about this it is a priority for us and that we do have a scheme of work in place to support um, victims and witnesses um, again this probably be working with uh, the communications team to ensure that hate crime and the key themes are included in the forward planning and also working with Joe's team and ensuring that hate crime and some of the work coming out of the strategy is also included in the wider community safety strategy and that and the Haringey deal as well. So um, finally, um, one of our key themes is reporting. Um, and this is kind of based just to give some context two of the sort of recommendations as you will probably know that came from the Lord McPherson inquiry around the death of Stephen Lawrence were focused specifically on reporting so um, from the inquiry it came out that people should be able to report at locations other than police stations and be able to report 24 hours a day so when working with sort of community groups and partners such as Tell Mama and CST and Wise Thoughts um, we now understand that actually people are more inclined to report to those agencies where they feel safe, where it's very trusted, uh, where they kind of speak the language, have the same culture, the background as, as, as the people who are um, kind of experiencing the hate crime. So for me and for kind of us, it's about kind of really reaffirming these relationships and ensuring that we are advertising third party reporting and we do um, kind of have that link in with these um, community organisations who were able to provide that service. Um, again, um, kind of linking into this theme as well is uh, tensions monitoring. So currently, uh, myself and the Prevent team, um, we run a tensions monitoring strategic group and that's why we sort of kind of manage all the tensions in the borough. Um, we see what's going on and identify any sort of emerging threats or risk and then work as a partnership to provide mitigation, mitigating actions. Um, so this will um, continue. Again, one of the asks of the CSP is to support um, the work around monitoring tensions and to really encourage staff to um, report any tensions you've got via the tensions monitoring form just so we can get better understanding of the picture and the makeup and every time we receive attention we link in with the police as well just to um, kind of cooperate to see what they've got um, into information share and then continuous um, improvement so this is something that's currently in development with the missed hate crime lead uh, with the police and it's really to understand um, those hate crime cases that reached uh, no further action or a, a negative outcome. Um, and it's essentially to scrutinise or quality check these cases to see if there's anything that could have been done to prevent the NFA or to provide better support to the victim. Um, so we're currently in discussions with uh, our police colleagues to see how we can reignite this because it's something that was done a few years ago. Um, and we'd use the hate crime delivery group as a forum to facilitate um, this work. So that's a that's a kind of very quick um, sort of roundup of um, the five key approaches and the bullet points under each approach are just kind of um, initial thoughts around the sorts of activities that we could do under each theme so kind of when we develop this and when we go out to residents and key community groups and faith leads I expect sort of some of these activities to expand um, and to kind of um, yeah more sort of um, ideas or initiatives to come under um, each banner um, so what I thought would be good because obviously this is this is such a new piece of work um, it would be very good um, to get kind of the thoughts um, initial thoughts of the CSP um, just to gain an understanding of views um, which obviously will really help to shape this work going forward um, so these are the five, four questions um, I think what I'll do is I will stop. Sh oh no, I can see you. That's fine. <laughs> um, so I think what we'll do is we'll just go through each question. I'll jot down some notes and we'll just take it quite an organic discussion around um, some of the things that are coming up. So my first question 
is do you agree that the five key um, themes or work streams do all that we can to promote a zero zero tolerance approach to hate crime and discrimination and then an add-on for this is there any gaps or further opportunities for partnership working so kind of what I've just presented in terms of those five key points is there anything that's really blatantly missing or any sort of areas for partnership working where you think oh actually we could be doing this um, we're missing a trick here um, so if I start with those two and then go on to the second two Great, thanks, thanks, Heather. Now, let's open this round to folks. So it's a very smart way of making sure people are paying attention uh, to presentations <laughs> too, Heather. So uh, let's let, let's open this up for conversation. Are there any colleagues who want to start us off? Um, I'll work? jump is, in. Is, oh, sorry. Oh, it's Emily. Um, Hi, I was Emily. just going to, um, obviously it's kind of covered somewhat um, anyway, um, but just also to reflect on that um, we should also be taking a zero, zero tolerance approach to hate crime and discrimination also with staff um, as well. Yeah. Um, obviously a lot of staff that, um, you know, out and about doing their jobs and um, they often get that sort of abuse. And I think it's kind of one of those things where not that it's accepted whatsoever, but almost just kind of brushed under the carpet, so to speak, because it's just, you know, I'm just going about my job. It is what it is. Yeah. Um, and promoting that internally as well, not even just to our communities and stuff. But, you know, that sort of flagging that general kind of approach and reporting methods and that sort of thing, as you said, so we can cover it from all angles and not just, you know, on the outside have a zero tolerance approach but then internally yeah. kind of partially accepting it so um that's just sort of my comment on that bit yeah I think that's a really good idea and maybe that's something that we can think about being an extra theme or something that's sort of cross-cutting um during hate crime awareness week we delivered um quite a bit of training to staff and that was one of the key sort of comments that came out during the week around what do we do if an incident happens when we're out on the street, or we're dealing with residents, or we're door knocking, um, who do we report that to? Um, is it serious enough to report it? Um, I don't feel like it is. It was just a passing comment. I should just brush it off. But what we're seeing here is that it's really important to report every incident uh, just so we can get a picture of the landscape, even if it doesn't meet the threshold for sort of criminality or going down the criminal justice route. And we had a really good discussion with um, on Friday, one of the events was a staff network panel discussion, which has been recorded and um, it can be disseminated amongst staff. And that was all about kind of how we, ca what can we do as a workforce to really promote inclusivity in a kind of environment where actually hate and comments will be challenged. So internally, staff to staff, but also when staff are out and dealing with residents. So I think one of the things that we thought about was reigniting the digni dignity at work policy, maybe having a look at that, maybe reviewing it and then really kind of asking managers to take ownership of that and reinforcing the policy in team meetings and um, with colleagues to to to, re to really kind of show that there is a policy that we need to follow and a process to embed that process within within teams. Um, so yeah, thank you, Emily. That's definitely something that we can we can think about going forward. It's really important as well, really. Who's next? We've got Marco. Hi, thanks. Now, thanks for the presentation. I think it's just to. Um... It's like back up Emily's uh, comments about that all too often that all of us and all of our work roles will brush it off by saying it's just part of the job, whichever comments are made internally or externally. So just to um, it's, it's just to support that. And obviously I don't deal with hate crime per se. That's dealt with by my colleagues on response, but I did deal with hate crime pre BCU model. So um, I would encourage reporting to police and then we can then work through with the victim. <laughs> and yeah. sift through the evidence and take it to CPS and then with the CPS then we'll obviously come to a determination if we can um, substantiate a criminal investigation and then the charge thereafter yeah. but um, always encourage a positive reporting if we don't get to hear about it we can't identify the trends sometimes can we so absolutely but, uh, and fine points sorry. Mentioned. yeah no, no absolutely and just to come back on that one like um, what we've been talking about is the reporting like a two-pronged approach 
absolutely reporting to the police to ensure that you know the the crime um kind of goes through the criminal justice system and the offender is held accountable but then also working with um the likes of cst Talmama, wise thoughts all those community groups that represent the five protective characteristics to offer that therapeutic support as well and um i know we've got a really great working relationship with victim support with the asb angle um I'm not sure if they deal with hate crime, but that's something that we're kind of talking about, whether or not those uh, referrals can be um, referred to us in terms of our, the support that we're offering as a council with uh, connected communities. Um, I can see there's a, a couple of thumbs raised there, but yeah, that's um, something that we're, we're in discussion with at the moment, but absolutely taking that the, the therapy the tailored bespoke support as well as the sort of enforcement action for the perpetrator. Thanks, Heather. Sandy. Thank you, Chair. Um, so yeah, in terms of these questions, um, particularly the, the first one, I think generally speaking, these these do seem like the right type of work streams in order to really have the most comprehensive approach that we could have um, to to hate crime. Um, in particular, I think, and that has been said already now, the, the reporting and awareness aspects, I think, are, are quite key. Uh, from, from my perspective, looking at the data and the information, clearly, I think there is a significant amount of under-reporting, and we know there's probably a lot more that goes on in the borough, in all crime types, but, but particularly with hate crime, um, than, than we capture. And there's particular groups I think particular communities who probably um, do suffer from hate crime in a, to a far, far larger extent than our information necessarily points us to. And that's obviously that makes it difficult when we're looking to deploy resources or to do positive work to, to improve that picture. So I think these are the, the correct work streams, but particularly just trying to ensure that we, we do all we can to reach our hard to reach communities or, or you know, um, if, if that's what we're going to kind of call them, perhaps um, to ensure that, you know, not only they have an understanding of what hate crime is, but also have a an easy and confident way to report, you know, those incidents, because I think oftentimes those communities struggle to, to know what to do with that uh, and then also perhaps don't have the confidence in what's going to happen following that. Um, so from my perspective, um, you know, seeing increases in, in the numbers of reports perhaps isn't necessarily a bad thing if that's being driven by increased reporting. Clearly, we don't, we don't want to see more hate crime taking place, but would like to see a large proportion of it being reported. Thank you. Thanks, Sandeep. Lynette. Sorry, I'm a bit of a technophobe with teams. So every time the team looks different. Uh, brilliant. Uh, really uh, good presentation, Heather, and really interested um, in this area. I think you probably have got the right uh, work streams at the moment because if we look at your point about the fact that we need to know more about why people aren't reporting um, and building that confidence, um, it's good to. Um, I suppose, set out on a journey with things like this. I wanted to say um, in relation to um, some of the um, people that you're trying to protect against race crime, that um, the amount of community organisations that you say you're working with that could report, that people can report to instead of the police, so that they can almost use them as a, a mediator in between themselves and the police, um, sorry, two of them I don't know anything about, um, so I don't know how the community would. And absolutely, Wise Thoughts is the only real LGBTQ plus IA organisation that we've got. But what we're doing around race and disability, because strangely enough, I run Mind in Haringey, and I can assure you that people with mental health issues and then the, maybe the intersectionality, either they've got mental health and they've got a further disability or they've got mental health and they come from the black yeah. community or, yeah, but we've never yeah. been approached in relation to the hate crime um, or anywhere near this. I'd love to have been involved in the hate crime awareness week, but we knew nothing of it. Um, and if you actually think about mental health, we're very good at understanding, uh, particularly MIND, the importance of awareness campaigns and that you continue to um, ensure that we get more people joining them as time goes by. Brilliant to hear that you're doing some of this work in schools and colleges, etc. Because, um, yeah, absolutely, um, there could be issues um, in there. But I think that there are community organisations that might be well placed to be the person that can take some of these reports and then pass them on to the police or other and I'd love training for my staff team and I know that they're always engaged in other things that can help them support 
those that we support with mental health. So just a little bit, oh, how didn't we know about this? Uh, how do we know about the date? How do we know about the training? And who is doing something about people from our diverse community reporting this? Because they wouldn't be going to Wise Thoughts. And I yeah. don't think that they would know anything about those other two. I think they're national organizations. So I think if we're going to get this right, we really need to include more community groups. I can easily think of uh, RISE, uh, yeah. you versus you and, and others that actually work directly with these communities that I suspect are not reporting at all because for some of those communities and I could definitely think about young people in there they are not going to report it to the police but they will report it to somebody in the hope that they can support them um, with reporting it to the police which I think eventually they would probably like to do that so it'd be really interesting won't it to find out why people are not reporting but yeah. at the same time make it easier for them to report and I always think so I'm just going to make one other point um, we talk about these um, things that are really important to all of us um, and what we don't do is make some kind of way that we're all making a statement that we're behind hate crime um, or stopping zero tolerance I think you said so we would be more than happy to show some kind of emblem, put something on our website, put something in our windows. I think we have to go that far. If we're really going to stop something and call it zero tolerance, then we're not doing enough at the moment. Yeah, because it's the first time I've been in a meeting and heard about it. Um, yeah. I'm, in a, I'm in a lot of meetings, Heather. Yeah, but anyway, <laughs> really you. good. And please yeah. contact us. We'd love to support what you're doing, OK? Yeah, thank you so much, Lynette. And just please, um, genuine apologies that you didn't receive the invite for Hate Crime Awareness Week and the Faith and Breakfast event. But the training doesn't, it's not limited to Hate Crime Awareness Week. So I'm more than happy to come to mind uh, your different partner organisations to deliver. Um, just a couple of the points that you raised there around sort of... Um, real community local community groups for race um protective characteristics um we did i mean uh, this this piece of work and kind of what we're working on is in its very sort of junior stages at the moment as i said i've been in role for a couple of months and i'm really just trying to build a repertoire of what community support we've got there um we've got that are able to help people um particularly victims and um help them through that reporting process or um, guide them um, and, and guide them through. So it'd be really great if we could have a conversation because, um, you know, we've got Wise Thoughts, Haringey Disability Action, um, which helps kind of um, people with disability and illnesses. Tell Mama, um, obviously a national organisation, but also has some local footprint in uh, Haringey as well as CST, which is um, anti-Semitism abuse. Um, but it, there wasn't anything, even though all of those organisations are intersectional. So Tell Mama, um, deals with race, hate, crime, as well as Islamophobia and um, so on and so forth. But that might not be the most beneficial sort of um, support service for that particular person. So it would be really great to kind of have a better understanding of what community organisations are out there that can support people um, from the race category or different races, um, just kind of building up the repertoire at the moment. So, yeah, thank you so much for your support, Lynette. And um, yeah, I'll be in touch. Thanks, Heather. Thanks, Lynette. Uh, Rona. Thank you, Heather. Um, really comprehensive. And I feel like I'm reliving yesterday evening. I spent two hours um, in an Enfield meeting yesterday evening talking about this exact same topic. So interesting timing and um, really similar themes, which I think is really helpful to see, particularly kind of for us as a partnership working across both boroughs. And um, I just really wanted to come in and, and Sandy kind of said what I was going to say, but if you don't mind me touching on it a bit more. So just I know it sounds like minutia but the just the word reporting for one of those steps I wonder if we could just change that because I do think to reflect Sandeep's point what we really want to do is increase reporting I think we need to acknowledge the low levels particularly among when you look at some of the data um, particularly even kind of disability when you look at the really low levels I think mm. of what's probably reported there and that goes across every um, characteristic that we're talking about but I really do feel that's more evident in some than others um, and I also just want to touch on what Lynette said, really. I think it's a really valid point. Um, and I, I think we absolutely should be talking about not just increasing formal reporting to the police, but also increasing reporting to organization, other organisations, because I think we need to accept 
um, that the, the reality is that many people, some people at least, will feel unable and lack the confidence to report to police. Um, and I think it's really important for the police and us to have a, have a real clear steer around satisfaction. Um, because often what matters most to victims and leaves the biggest impact isn't necessarily the criminal justice outcome. Actually, it's how they felt and how they were taken seriously and um, the kind of service that they were provided. I know locally we are doing that and I just thought I'd mention it there, but I do think that importance around accessibility of different reporting methods and increasing reporting needs to be really clear because often I think it's quite brave for public authorities to almost say that we want to see higher numbers reported um, and that never feels like a success. But I think actually in this case with hate crime, akin to crimes like domestic abuse and sexual offences, I think we need to recognise it's widely underreported. And I was just really pleased to see in there um, the focus on, on young people and the inclusivity of young people. I'm sure you've probably seen, Heather, I was quite surprised by it, if I'm really honest, the Youth Voice Survey that MOPAC did recently, 2021 to 2022, I think it's something like 120,000 young people aged 11 to 16 across London. Um, I think 10% of them said they had suffered, um, a, been a victim of crime in the preceding 12 months. 30% of those crimes were hate crimes, which really surprised yeah. me, actually. Um, and it was significantly disproportionate to non-binary gender. Um, so just an interesting thing, and I think it refers back to, forgive me, I can't remember who said it, um, but someone referred to really understanding what the barriers to reporting are and what the themes are. And I, I think it is important to acknowledge that we don't necessarily, I don't think, have confidence in saying at the moment we fully understand some of the issues and some of the challenges for people. More comments than questions, um, but I hope that's helpful, <laughs> Heather. No, that's really helpful. And um, just to say, I used to work in the prevent team and quite a lot of the referrals that we got through that didn't meet the threshold for prevent for support were based upon um, hate and um, prejudicial yeah. views being banded about the classroom, uh, particularly racism and homophobia. Um, so this is something that we, you know, via training and workshops and education in schools um, as well to teachers, we hope to kind of raise awareness of this and say it's not acceptable. It shouldn't be something that, you know, you should just brush off or feel like it's just because it's your identity. It doesn't matter. Um, so hopefully, yeah, I think certainly for me, the target is to see an increase of reports and particularly working with those groups. I know there was 11, yeah. um, 11 reports of disability um, related crime reported last year um, and that's 11 across the yeah. whole year, which is, yeah, which is not good. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Heather. Thank you. Thanks, Anne. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor. Thank you, Heather. Uh, um, really interesting report and I, I want to connect yours um, and Joe's before you if I may it, so this is my attempt and it's about young people feeling safe and though it may not be a, a specific hate crime by category there is an issue about postcode lottery postcode lotteries postcode um, areas um, and I'm linking the two because we know that children are vulnerable and are targeted for um, uh, county lines. And we know that children with disabilities are targeted um, for county lines in particular. And though it may not be a specific hate crime, but the way that you've described it was about perception. We in this room could perceive that to be a hate crime the targeting of our vulnerable children and young people. And then that links up me in my head to, to joining the two. If we could perceive it as that, then it what are we doing it, um, linking it up with, with, with the strategy that Joe spoke of? Um, so that, that's a suggestion really mm. um, from me. Uh, can, I might be completely at a tangent, <laughs> um, but when young people speak, it, they have normalised not being able to walk around the borough freely, as I did when I was younger. They walk around with a different set, a different map in their heads about where they can't, can and can't go. And I just think that's the most intense bullying um, that we can speak of. So, I, I mean, you know, 
what are we as a borough going to do to be sure that children are safe to walk around the, 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 the borough freely? And it does link to drugs, as Councillor Brabazon mentioned at the very start of this meeting, and that being a priority for us to work on with the community. So I link all three of those bits, really. I'm sorry if I am at a tangent. I'm happy to be told that straight away. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, in my eyes, absolutely not. I think kind of hate crime links into the exploitation uh, segment of the community safety strategy. So, yeah, that's definitely a conversation that we could have. Whether or not it will go past through the criminal justice system um, with an uplift of hate crime, um, I'm not sure. That's probably one yeah. for the police. But I think in terms of our support and what we can offer that young person who is experiencing that exploitation because of their identity then yeah. we can absolutely offer and you know the, the same support as we would for somebody who was affected by a different type of crime yeah and yeah. i was just going to say as well i think and you're right i think it's about characteristics so there is a, a definite uh, uh, link across those areas that you mentioned because often these young people have certain characteristics yeah. That, that make them more susceptible to being targeted. So, yeah, we'll definitely take that on board. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Anne. Uh, you both. Sorry, uh, Chair. I think Councillor Bravazon was, was before me. I, I will defer to Councillor Bravazon. That's okay. You, but I'm moving it around so that there's a range okay. of people speaking. Okay, fine. Sorry, Councillor Bravazon. Uh, so, for me, a That's couple right. of. I'm in the chair, you, but don't worry. <laughs> Dina can take that with me, not you. <laughs> okay, thank you. So, um, yes, I agree that uh, the work streams uh, appear to be right. I think that we know that there's some members of our community that are more vulnerable than others, or perhaps more vulnerable. You know, that we've spoken to our Somali community, our Jewish communities, and some of our Muslim um, uh, communities. So, for me, it's about speaking to those communities and where do they go for support? Sometimes we perceive uh, what we think is the best place, but I'm sure that those those communities go to some already. So it'd be good to tie into that. That's similar to Lynette's comment. Um, I'm really keen on the third party reporting aspect. We know that there's a lack of trust in in uh, in uh, the MPS, but that that spans much wider than the police. It's local authorities, it's the fire brigade, it's the LAS. Um, and I think similar to Emily's question, how do you make this everyone's business? I know we say zero tolerance. But how do you make sure that everyone's communities and staff tackle that? Um, and I do agree with Rona's term about um, increasing reporting. We know that we've seen that in the war world, violence against women and girls, where you know we try and tackle certain things. But I will work with the team and, and, and pick some of those things up. Um, just an aside, uh, Chair, we're going to be consulting on a lot of things. I think we really do need to think about how we're going to consult with the communities, because you think they're probably going to get very bored very quickly of us consulting very quickly. So maybe what we can do is look at tying up the community safety strategy with communication on hate crime rather than yeah. going back to the same communities over and over again. It's something that I've raised with Andy. That's a good point. Um, something I've raised with Andy about maybe we need a, a calendar across the council about, you know, maybe join up, you know, thematic areas. So thank you, Chair. Good point. Thanks, you. But Sina. Um, Yes, I, I, I think my point might be slightly tangential, or I hope it isn't, but a bit like I want to follow on a bit from Anne and so on. But I think what's there's nothing in here about um, virtual hate crime um, and social media. And given the fact that we've had such distressing, I know we, we, we you know, we have distressing stories about young people, particularly hugely affected by social media in one one way or another and that the, the virtual world there is almost permission to be abusive to people people say things on social media they wouldn't say in real life i don't think or there are people who do that and i think i'm not sure where it fits but i think somewhere in our strategy we should be addressing the issues of what is communicated on social media or how people can report or what we can do to prevent it i'm not very au fait on the online bill but I, I think that a local level we particularly with young people we need to be saying something about about that and reporting because it's it's just so grotesque what people people think they can say in social media without any accountability so I don't know quite know where it fits but for me I thought that was a bit of a gap in in this 
because we've got people in the real world and people in the virtual world and many people spend a lot of time in the virtual world yeah many people don't realize it's the same thing you know we can what we do in the virtual world impacts us on in the real world as well no that's a that's a brilliant point thank you so much councillor um in trade yeah. for example I say one our... more? yeah yeah sorry. sorry go ahead sorry go on uh, I was no, going I was... to say I think I think what we've seen over the years so with the growth of media virtual media it's a sort of privatization of young people's free time and children's time so whereas we had people would go out and meet their friends or young kids would play out loads of time is spent not doing that because of fear of safety and all sorts of other things and so this compounds in my mind the problems that that can really affect young people and children in particular um, in in how they see the world and how they see themselves and I know I know when I was a magistrate how difficult you know some of the stuff we did on pre pre-charge bail the police will know about this with these hugely complicated crimes of, of online and digital abuse uh, I, I just think it's an area we need to think about that's all thank you thanks thanks Adam thank you thanks Nina. yeah Emily oh sorry how do you want to come back no, I was just going to say absolutely, and I think maybe we need to be a bit more explicit in our approach to sort of tackling online hate. Um, it's 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 very embedded within the Erase and Awareness section in the training. Um, a segment of the training looks at um, kind of online hate, differences between online and offline, and, and the importance of still reporting um, online hate. Um, but yeah, maybe it just needs to be a bit more explicit. Um, we're working a lot with quite a lot of the prevent referrals um, in nature um, kind of stem from online sort of hate and extremism. So I think there's a lot of work to be had in terms of partnering with prevent if they receive um, a referral. Maybe there's some work that we could do looking at the impact um, of that referral, i.e. the impact of um, somebody doing something online, um, how is that affecting the children in the school, um, has it, is there a particular victim that we need to work with, that sort of thing. So yeah, thank you for that. Emily. Yes, um, it was only a quick one really, um, just around the third party um, reporting um, type stuff again. Um, we in housing and sort of crossing over into um, enforcement and engagement, um, we are doing like a pilot action plan um, on Broadwater Farm at the moment, but part of that is looking at third party reporting um, in respect of ASB. Um, obviously the same issues in that we believe it's widely underreported um so we're sort of looking at that so just as an fyi really that we could potentially link in around those sorts of schemes and training um and then looking at um because i know that other places i don't know if harringay have had them historically or anything but like hate crime ambassador um type roles um and obviously looking not necessarily as third party reporting as such but just more awareness so you know people that are more likely to witness this sort of behavior and i think heather you've had something similar um with like a microsoft forms um upload or something just as like a information only kind of thing like this is happening this is what's going on so in lieu of kind of you know formal reporting whether that's even to the council or police or whatever um just looking at those sorts of streams as well just for people that are in our communities and are willing to sort of commit to that sort of process as well going forward would be quite good yeah definitely i think the form uh, that you're referring to is the tension monitoring form so it is that one really, yeah, yeah i didn't want to commit completely no, but i was fine. like there's, there's definitely a form <laughs> it's a really good sort of way of people um you know us receiving information for, from people um really quickly without having to sort of involve um the police or the authorities but that's but in saying that we will always um if we do get attention recorded then we will always pass yeah, that on to the police up, as well yeah follow it up. yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, no, that's that's uh, the, the Broadwater Farm um, initiative sounds really great to partner up on. Thank you, Emily. Thank you. OK, great. So that's the first two questions.
Heather, do you, are we doing? What do you want? What are we? Oh, doing? sorry. <laughs> yeah, so we've got um, we've got the second two. Um, I appreciate that we've took up quite some time on this item, so I'm happy to sort of either we can do it now. That's absolutely no problem. But if people wanted to kind of take them away, have a think about it, um, and then um, either email myself or um, yeah, no. just what just whatever's up, whatever you think a chair is. Well, can I can I suggest that we move that to email? So now, are you able to circulate the um, the questions to all the members, please? Yeah, that can be done. And and then and and then in conjunction with Heather, and then we can make sure that there's a specific email saying two questions, any thoughts, and we get them back. Yep. Does that work? Yeah, that's very easily done. I've done that Great, before. Thank, thank you, Gavin. Your hands up. Yes. Um. I just. Uh. I just thought it would be good just to um, acknowledge the hard work that Heather did last week for the hate crime week. I thought it was a real success and uh, to appreciate the hard work that you did there, Heather. And and also um, just just for everyone to uh, sort of take on board the fourth question, which is, you know, Heather is, is one person within, uh, you know, trying to coordinate things on hate crime. But the real key is, is us working as a partnership. So we're really interested to know what your role is here to help uh, the, the five approaches that, that, that we're looking at as well. So we'd really appreciate if uh, when people email that they concentrate particularly on, on the, what their contribution is as well. Gavin, you took my, I'm not going to say it, there's no point me saying it now, I was, was going to do exactly that. Um, but uh, yeah, it was a very good session last week and uh, I, I enjoyed it and others who were there did too. Um, so thank you, Heather. Okay. Uh, those questions will be circulated. Can we note that presentation, please? Yes, noted. Okay, all right. Thanks, Heather. Uh, item nine, weeks of action. Gavin. Thanks. Thanks, Chair. So um, uh, in, in the pack, we've circulated a report and a, and a presentation. So I'm, I'm just going to share the presentation now. Before you say it, I will go on slideshow. Thanks. I assume most, I assume everyone, um, yeah, I assume people read their papers. So maybe you want to do an overview and then we can go straight to questions or points. Yeah, great. So um, thank you, Chair. So um, the, the the weeks of action um, is is a, an overall kind of commitment that, uh, that that's come out of the of the uh, the Labour manifesto um, and uh, the strong emphasis on on people power uh, within that kind of manifesto is something that we've been looking at. Um, and one of those key things was to carry out a week of action uh, of which we can sort of deploy services. So the week, the aim of the weeks of action is for, for all services to contribute to focus in and around a particular area or hotspot um, uh, of crime th throughout the borough. Uh, this involves both um, council and and uh, and partners using a highly visible approach, uh, being proactive in, in engagement with residents um, and people who are living and working around the borough, listening to their concerns and then looking to try and resolve some of the issues. We're, we're very keen, uh, and I'm going to talk about that, to kind of link in closely with the police who are also doing a similar thing with their attempt uh, of, of action weeks in the positive action initiatives. Um, and we want to sort of ensure that we work across a range of services. Um, so we've, we, uh, we, we've planned uh, uh, a week of action which happened in and around kind of Bruce Grove. The idea is, is that the weeks of action uh, would be throughout the, throughout the borough and that we would use evidence-based problem-solving techniques to, to try and target the areas that we're doing. But mindful that it, it, we don't just want uh, weeks of action just to be in the east of the borough, it needs to be across the borough. Um, visibility is a real um, priority for us so that the public can see, uh, um, uh, you know, that the council and its partners uh, are, are doing all that they can to um, to be both visible and to to work on uh, uh, the issues of which people feel very passionately about. Um, we've got some sort of um, outcome forms and activity forms so that we can look at what uh, what different partners are going to do. Uh, and and then try and sort of coordinate some of that work. 
so as I said, we we had uh, um, um, an initial week of action, which was piloted around Bruce Grove Ward. Um, this was uh, chosen as a uh, because there, there were various sort of uh, crimes uh, in and around the kind of station uh, area. So we worked across a, a range of different services with connected communities, the ASB team, the police, Haringey Gold, uh, Litter and Waste. Our, uh, our waste and cleansing teams, uh, the home improvement as in housing, private sector housing, there was trading standards, Bubic, homeless outreach, as well as other services. And we've also reflected on uh, our, our um, initial weeks of action to see uh, what lessons that we can learn. And we're actually planning to do one in December, which I'll, I'll go on to talk about. So some of the outcomes that came from, uh, from the first week of action is that there were nearly sort of 400 uh, interactions with members of the public and, and businesses. We had uh, improvement notices served, um, statutory notice served in private sector housing. We engaged with trading standards in the main with 115 business operators. Uh, we uh, removed some graffiti and did some particular street cleansing activities and we carried out some ASB and litter patrols and, and other areas which were highlighted for enforcement. There are a few kind of lessons learned uh, um, from the first uh, week of action. We think that we need to be even more visible. Um, we need to capture more information from the residents um, rather than just uh, carrying out the engagement, actually have a sort of form that um, that uh, that targets um, uh, and records what, what people are saying to us rather than just responding to that. Um, we've, we felt that having some sort of fixed stand seemed to work best to attract people. Um, whilst we, we have been able to note outputs, um, we think we can better ca capture some of the outputs in a more timely fashion as well as scheduling things in uh, uh, and the activities in a more coordinated way between us. Um, there are one or two services of which we, we will be looking to sort of reach out to, have already done so, such as the Fire Brigade. Um, and, and we know we've had f feedback from, from other services outside. Uh, of uh, our, our usual uh, uh, areas who are keen to kind of get involved with some of the engagement. Um, so I, I guess um, I just, we wanted to sort of bring this to the attention of the of, of the partnership board here. Note um, some of the outcomes of the pilot uh, of our sort of pilot week. Take any feedback that people have had, um, and, um, and and try and encourage. Uh, um, any partners that that we may have missed to help uh, missed rather to deploy resources uh, to support us. Uh, our next proposed uh, week of action is uh, is uh, on the fifth to the eleventh of December. We'll be sending some information out about that uh, today or tomorrow um, um, in the Wood Green area. And the reason that we've sort of chosen this area is because it linked directly in with the police's positive action initiative as well as um, Operation Nightingale, which covers the south end of the Wood, of, of Wood Green and kind of High Street. So we're very keen to be making sure that, that we join up as, as much as we can uh, to have as much impact as we can. So just, just those two questions, Chair, really. Um, the, the first is, is um, uh, uh, to note if there's any, a, any sort of particular feedback um, that, that people want to give or questions in relation to uh, into the weeks of action. And then the second, just to encourage um, sort of all partners. I know that obviously the police are on board because I've had discussions with Jonathan already uh, and Anna uh, Dimitriou in the police um, uh, about our sort of uh, weeks of action. So um, yeah, just open up to kind of questions or comments. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, I was sorry that I wasn't able to play more of a role in the, in the first week, but I caught the bloody dreaded COVID. So. It floored me, and I think um, uh, Jonathan uh, in, in consult, I was uh, pulling an excuse, but um, uh, that's definitely positive. Uh, okay, so Jonathan uh, Waterfield, your hands up. Yeah, just going to come in and support uh, uh, Gavin. I think from a police point of view and local authority point of view, uh, we, we probably stand hand in hand as a probably organisation that people accept that we're there, but don't necessarily perhaps engage with us um, in many ways, but obviously want to have their fair share of 
things being done for them. And it's something we probably struggle with around how you measure confidence, you know, what, what the police done for us, and I guess um, how we can work in partnership with you. It's something that we've struggled across um, similar, and it's really hopefully will work um, from a police partnership point of view for the good stuff that we do together uh, and for the public to see that, to really target those locations. Um, so yeah, I think we definitely learned from the first one and looking forward to really um, progressing further in Wood Green, uh, where I think we've got more of a, um, a, a sort of a landscape there with some of the engagement we've done with our town centre team to really have some analytical sort of data around where what best value we can have um, and then trying to communicate that out. So I know, uh, as you said, those um, pop-up places work really well when we've done our outreach outside the library uh, people coming towards them have worked really well so yeah we're really good to stand alongside you so thank you Gary. Thank you. Um, what sorry can if I can to just add I know that there's um, the regeneration uh, team are, are prioritizing a sort of green voices and one of the things that um, that we hope to do with this sort of week of action, which is why I pushed it back perhaps a week later, was that there should be some outcomes from that engagement, which which we can then kind of target it, um, um, according to the um, um, the outcomes of, of of their engagement piece, which I think would be really good. Sorry. Great, thank you. OK, uh, any other thoughts from people? No, well, look, look, there's a. I know that there's um, there've been conversations with the leader, and there's an evolving uh, plan of things, seeing what works, keep make, uh, updating it, and as it works way around the borough. So, I think this is a a very good way of making people feel out in the community that we take these issues seriously, and we're willing to you know focus and and zone in on particular areas. So, looking forward to seeing how that progresses uh, into a green and beyond. Can we note the weeks of action update then? Yes. OK. All right. Jonathan, item 10, local policing model. Again, if you want to just do a, a headline, because uh, I, I hope people will have broadly. Uh... Absolutely. And I think you're privy to know a certain amount of this has moved on. But I think it's still re uh, worth reflecting on some of it. So hopefully uh, we're in the right uh, view mode. Uh, can you see the uh, screen? Yeah, good. OK. Um, after everybody, uh, Jonathan Waterfield, so responsibility for neighbourhood policing uh, in Haringey. Um, so I've got the wards under me, uh, the town centre team, a couple of proactive units, and also schools, uh, but that stretches across Enfield and Haringey. So I think many of you know, um, I guess, a benchmark back in May that the um, ward boundaries changed, an extra two wards for Haringey, and there's been a lot of questions of how that has affected policing. So hopefully this will bring you up to speed around that uh, and the review that policing has undertaken in the last year or so. So bear in mind, obviously, each uh, area of policing only has a certain finite number of police officers. We're allocated um, centrally, uh, and then they have to be shared amongst the different areas, uh, response, local investigations, our public protection team, um, HQ, and our neighbour policing team uh, to, to fill. Um, so our BWT numbers are around about um, 1,283 is what we are allocated of number officers. Um, and again, trying to spread that across a uh, demanding area and making sure they're valued for they are. So the bit about neighbourhoods to um, cover off here, which I think is really key for the group and the, and the, uh, the board, is just sort of asking, well, what does that mean on neighbourhoods? Um, for me, neighbourhoods is such a key part of policing. Uh, it's that partnership work, and I probably could have, um, you know, list a huge list of activities that we undertake. Uh, but pretty much, the MOPAC model is each ward. There was around 650 wards uh, in London under the other model. Um, has two dedicated ward officers and a police constable support officer, police SO. Uh, and clearly, their roles around engagement, uh, confidence building, there, listening to the public, crime reduction. So much more we can do now around some of the. Um, I guess the data around hotspots uh, and how we can respond to that emerging issues, whether it's uh, burglary, robbery, criminal damage to try and tackle those issues and work in partnerships, solving those issues, uh, whether it's related to drug dealing, uh, problem addresses, working with us um, and social behaviour teams, the list goes on what Neighbours do, does. And what I think is such a reward, rewarding role. However, there is the element about the the depth and knowledge and also I think the resilience you need to make a real difference um, because in some ways all wards um, aren't the same and the, the value and the uh, demands that each one has is very different they're unique in their own different way so what the Met did was uh, back in 2021 and they did miss a trick here um, have to say 
Um, they looked at high harm locations, uh, both around uh, town centres and also around wards. So the Met decided, so manager board, commissioner level, we're going to introduce an extra 650 officers uh, into neighbour policing, and they're going to be based at high harm locations. So the simple log uh, logic, a very affluent area with low crime levels, uh, so that has a two and one ratio, that isn't really proportionate to another area that is high crime, high violence, uh, low confidence. Um, in addition, um, they recognise that town centres, uh, particularly the West End, uh, is an area where there's a high amount of violence, um, crime, and again, limited numbers of officers there allocated to that, and actually it's better off if you can concentrate a number of officers in those locations. So what the Met did is took the top five out of that 650, uh, took 500 officers to um, service um, 19 uh, town centre teams, uh, based on one inspector, three sergeants and 21. Uh, basically, the West End got a double team. Uh, and what happened as the data before they got launched uh, for Wood Green was number 11, and I'll come to that shortly. Um, and that gave, uh, released those officers uh, to set up. So the Wood Green Town Centre team uh, was on the first uh, tranche, and that uh, got launched, I think, from memory, the 4th of December. So it won't be until a couple more time, a uh, month or half time, we'll be up to its first anniversary on that. Um, in addition, the Met said, well, hold on a second here. As I said earlier, we've got some high harm wards. If we want to make a real difference around violence, uh, protecting the public, um, then we need to have an uplift on those wards. So they looked at the top 75 wards, and each of those wards would get an extra two officers. So looking at the Wood Green Town Centre team, something that I had that you don't normally get the opportunity to do, um, and this was based on the data that I had around uh, a heat map of the data, um, I got to design what was the footprint for the town centre team. Um, so one inspector, Kirsty Clark leads that, uh, three sergeants, 21 PCs is what it is um, if it was at full capacity. Um, interestingly, what I would just drop to you now, um, Challenges post-COVID, you know, London is up for business um, and, and trying to measure the success of the town centre team is probably an interesting one to do. What I will say, I had a quick glance at a dashboard a moment ago, and if they ran it based on volume crime uh, as of today, where previously would have been 11, number one being the one you don't want to be, we would have dropped, which is a good sign, from 11 to 17. So we've, we're actually going in the right direction. Um, crime is actually going up in that hot spot, but uh, at a slower rate, um, and I think the town centre team have really been a key part of that. Uh, and I made sure in the footprint that I drew uh, for them to be responsible and accountability to, that include Duckett's Common um, and also the wider shopkeepers uh, going on Turnpike Lane towards the west as well, uh, and making sure they really did what was required of them. Um, so moving on to the uh, most violent wards. Um, so the data told us, and again, this is pre the ward boundaries, um, but these wards, so the six wards there would be hot class as high harm wards. So Tottenham Hill, Northumberland Park, West Green, uh, Tottenham Green, Seven Sisters and St Irons. Um, there's a couple of those which you'll know would have been changed by uh, footprint and uh, the boundary changes for, um, affected that way. So we've got extra officers um, allocated not to the extra officers, we got an extra um, post um, created uh, for those roles so that when it's at full capacity really gives a bit and officers aren't being taken away, that will give us an extra depth of knowledge um, to really make an impact in those locations. So this is what it looks like at the moment and I can circulate this as a separate file. Um, this is how we've clustered it, clustered our police at the moment. It works on the initial model and many of the sergeants you'll know um, who have covered those areas um, for a number of years uh, and the new additional ward boundaries, uh, additional wards uh, have been added. So we've got a cluster approach there. The uh, sergeant oversees a number of wards uh, between two and four. Uh, I'm conscious of um, Sergeant South, uh, he's got quite a lot there at the bottom, uh, South Tottenham, Seven Sisters, St Anne's and Hermitage Gardens. And what we've done is, um, hopefully for key stakeholders, local councillors that are represented here and other partners, there's a relationship, should be there already uh, with those local ward teams. But we've got mailboxes uh, for each one of them, for members of the public and through councillors uh, for any inquiries and to address that. And that's our setup at the moment. So what does that look like? Um, so the maths, when we try and um, 
vary that around. We had to share those, some extra officers around those war boundary changes. So we had the initial uh, pool of officers which for the high harm, and then we had the additional came afterwards uh, was the change of boundaries for the extra two wards that got increased. So what that looks like um, when we were at full capacity, and I'll come to the where we are now at the moment in November uh, 2022 shortly, is um, we've had to share the people across 20 wards. So 55 ward officers, um, each cluster I've said, and that's how they're mapped at the moment. You'll see a number of them. So currently at the moment, um, as per the plan, when we're at full capacity, Northumberland Park would have seven uh, DWOs, uh, Tottenham Hale four, West Green four, um, South Tottenham, we've had to move that to three to cover that area, uh, part of the footprint around the old Seven Sisters um, and Seven Sisters Ward 4 DWOs um, and again to cluster they can work together. So where we are also, uh, PCSOs is worth acknowledging um, and the positive means of the, the model still stands at only 19 PCSOs we've got. Uh, but the commissioner is looking to employ some more uh, PCS going forward. They are really valuable because, again, they don't get pulled away uh, to staff up either a team or centrally into central London um, aid. So, again, they're a key part of our burglary initiatives, um, supporting um, victims of crime, engagement and getting communications um, out. The last bit, just to cover off for everybody before any questions, that sort of neighbour policing model, uh, schools officers, uh, they are an important part of the policing model. Uh, not every school has a police officer. Uh, we're moving away from that, more for a clustered approach, um, supporting um, victims of crime and preventing based on intelligence, uh, but also making sure there's safe avenues of travel uh, before and after school, as well as um, passing on presentations to school uh, young people within schools um, around some of the issues uh, they're facing. Uh, we've got a youth engagement team at the moment. Uh, one officer does a brilliant role about that. That's linking into our youth groups, um, our different networks around there, and again, um, highlighting and, and signposting some young people um, into some areas to get them out of crime. Uh, and that's having a really good effect. So they're out of the sort of the bubble from the schools, but they're really working really well alongside um, stakeholders such as local authority. I'm grateful for your support in there. Uh, many of you know we've, we've managed to fight uh, for the right reason. Um, our tasking team, um, they come under Operation Taipan. It's a very small team um, based on one sergeant and about four to five PCs they've got at the moment. They've previously been focused in Ducats Common um, during autumn last year, at Northumberland Park, the early part of this year, and currently doing some fantastic work in Finchley Park. So they've really helped in some areas, uh, high crime areas, some proactive um, issues to tackle some um, non-ingrained issues, which is having a um, good effect. But again, it's difficult for us to service uh, all these different areas, but we, we believe they're adding such a really good value. We do have our back of house uh, team, and again, licensing, faith officers, ASB, demand reduction, uh, our, we used to engage as well with um, neighbored watch in different areas to get some uh, comms out and engagement's really part. So what's the, what's the challenges? And I'll come to this now, stability for ward officers, long-term knowledge, um, getting that relationship uh, built with our stakeholders, but also the um, partners, the ward chairs, the councillors on, um, on the streets is so important, knowledge they've got, and also struggling against the abstractions we have. London is a fast-moving city, uh, public order events week in, week out. Um, you'll see JSO are out protesting regularly, um, XR have been out, uh, and again, that takes officers away from their core role on neighbour policing. So I guess the add-on to add to you uh, where we are at the moment here in November, most of you in the room will have experienced uh, state key stakeholders, uh, the fact of your officers uh, being taken away from their role. That's been really disheartening from our point of view as leadership uh, within the borough, but also in neighbourhoods. Um, so the decision has been taken earlier this week uh, by the BC commander, partly because of the uh, levels of um, abstractions uh, taken, taken away to staff people up in ERPT. Uh, that's our response strand who are under strength, is to actually move a number of officers. Oops, I've dropped off. Uh, rebuild um, response team back to the numbers they should do. Um, so the caveat is we've had to reduce our town centre team uh, down to a small team to continue that work for the next few months. And we're likely to have to take a few officers away from our high harm wards uh, for a short time. 
We will, however, be getting new uh, fresh operators in. They do have a pathway, which uh, means they bounce, and many of you know that, bounce from response into neighbourhoods, which isn't given the stability many of us uh, want to take place. Uh, but I can assure you for every single ward, um, I will make sure I maintain every single ward does have their two DWOs um, in, in place. There's a couple that will be a short time without, but as they come in, arrive, I'll be posting them to make ah, sure they fill those, gaps, those gaps. Shorter. So I, that's the end of the presentation, if it dropped off um, from the PowerPoint. So really to bring you up today and open up to questions, I've got Superintendent Hub with me as well. So anything we can help to answer your questions, what neighbourhood policing looks like now, how the boundaries have affected it, uh, and any concerns um, going forward. Thank you, Jonathan. Anybody thoughts, comments? Rona, do you want to come in? I was going to wait for some questions to come in, um, Adam. I think Jonathan's given a really comprehensive update. I know the BC Commander sent out some comms. I sent out an email to all uh, ward, ward panel chairs as well last night to echo Caroline's message, just so everyone understands the position we're in, the fact that this is temporary, the reason behind the decision. And I hope a reassuring message that actually what this will enable is, yes, a smaller number of officers, but officers who are consistently there and are not abstracted, which unfortunately is not the position we've been in for the past few months, um, which isn't a position any of us wanted to be in, I can assure you. Um, I can see you, but saved the day. And I suppose hand up to stop me rabbiting on. Thank you, Rona. Um, I think my main concern is about the messaging to the community of producing our, our neighbourhood officers, especially in the wars that we've enhanced. Um, we, you know, uh, Councillor Barons was mentioning about the, the, the issue we've got with drugs. I'm, it, what's the communication plan with the Met to our communities? Because I'm sure when this gets cascaded more widely, it is going to uh, spark some concern. Yeah, absolutely. And Jonathan, sorry, I started talking. Apologies. Uh, go for it, Mom. Go, go for it. Um, so, Absolutely right, Uber. And I think I just want to acknowledge the elephant in the room, too, in that um, Samat Roli has come out with a really clear message that I, I hope is reassuring to everyone that he has a wholehearted commitment and um, that I think from partners who've met him have, I've, you know, had feedback that they felt that was very genuine commitment to neighbourhood policing and community police be policing being one of his absolute priorities and at the same time unfortunately locally we are having to to pull back some of our resources on neighborhoods to bolster our emergency policing teams and um, that feels really tricky in terms of timing and in terms of comms and um, i've been to a number of kind of public meetings this week and um, in terms of kind of partnership meetings not kind of residence meetings let me be clear and um, to make sure that i highlighted that to people because what i don't want to do is to pretend that this isn't happening and um, i think residents Residents and business owners have been acutely aware of the high levels of abstractions. I know they understand why, um, and I want them to be really clear about the fact that they will still have a team. It will be smaller. This is temporary, but that team will be there consistently, and we will still be delivering a service for them. And I've kind of made made the offer widely that any kind of concerns I'm more than happy to address, even with individuals. Um, so in terms of wider comms, in terms of residents, I didn't have any plans to kind of outwardly hugely advertise this what's really important to me is that key partners safer neighborhood um board uh, the ward chairs neighborhood watch that they understand that they know that because they ultimately have been raising concerns through councillors and others um, in recent months about the levels of abstractions and i feel it's important to update them in terms of wider community if i'm really honest and um, i don't feel people will notice a difference in terms of service uh, for the next few months, Hubert, because actually the ward teams that we've had and the officers that we're talking about have been heavily abstracted. I'm talking 60, 70 percent of their shifts, really, for the last few months anyway. So I don't feel people will notice the difference. I think they have noticed the difference over the last few months around abstractions. I think they'll continue to feel the same and probably not realise that some of the officers who were there have been moved on. But I'm happy to be really open and transparent about it, albeit I just think in terms of comms. I don't feel the need to kind of do it massively wider, but I'm happy to kind of any residence meetings, etc. I know I've committed to one. I think it's planned for January or February um, in Haringey in the west of the bar. I think they've requested one. I'm really happy to address it there then. But before that, I don't really feel 
the huge need to advertise it any wider. I think I've answered your question. I don't know, Jonathan, if you wanted to come in on anything. So, yeah, the only thing I would probably add is, um, Mom, to everybody, so for Harringay Ward, Knoll Park Ward, you won't notice any difference um, yeah. whatsoever. It's the same names. Uh, Cancer Jogi uh, for Hornsey Ward, uh, the gap that's appeared from a um, resignation. We're looking to plug uh, as quick as possible. Um, what I will be very clear about uh, for everyone to understand, that probably east-west divide, where you've got the um, east being more high-harm wards, I will, and I say this um, hand on, I have made sure that every ward on the west uh, will will have their two DWOs, uh, even with the extra two uh, wards that got created. Um, I was really, com as a person, um, that they had the continuity. The challenge we've got is a, a rotation system, which is breaking some of that, and officers do want to move on as their own development. Um, that stability and sometimes Frustratingly, it just work, works against us when all of a sudden uh, someone leaves for something else uh, and I can't move the next one in uh, until 28 days the next process. Um, but I want to be really clear, especially the west of the borough, um, do have the stability to really make sure they get their, their numbers as well. Um, the east, I've got to try and move resources around. We know the boundary issue hasn't made having any bigger. It's still exactly the same. Um, I really want those officers um, serving those communities to be more often there than not. If we take a view of roughly give their shift pattern of a, a month, 30 days, they're there for about 21 days uh, with their days off. I want them to be there for those 21 days, um, not staffing up. And I think that's where the benefits will actually um, actually come. And I think if I may, Chair, the only other question for me is timing. Will the No Park Town Centre team not be effective? Because um, if that's the case, then my concern would be about timing leading up to Christmas, because you know, Christmas at the time and that particular ward gets horrendously busy regarding you know, pickpocket and other various things, but that's not the case, I think that. Okay, thank you. Should I come in now, Chair? Yeah, please. Yes, Chair. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Um, ju just the point of clarification, really, for me. Um, I know in the um, in the email um, that was sent, um, there was talk about uh, utilising uh, external asset like TSG, VCTF uh, for for those times when uh, you know there's high community tensions or there's been a critical incident. I'm just, um, I suppose, for me, it's just kind of yeah, restating the the importance of making sure that there's some local briefings done, and um, because the last thing we want to do is whilst our communities might not notice. That some of the ward officers aren't there they yeah. will notice if tsg are up and down the road and and, and other um, and that can have a an impact on community relations as you know so it's just really a um a plea really just to make sure that where that is the case that we are obviously yeah. giving them and i know you guys have been doing that that local briefing around some of the sensitivities especially in some of those high arm wards that you mentioned uh, jonathan yeah, absolutely, Joe, and thank you. It's a really valid point and one that I actually uh, hadn't really picked up in terms of the possible interpretation of that email. So I guess just to be really clear, Joe, what we're not talking about is utilising external assets such as the Violent Crime Task Force or TSG to do the work of neighbourhood police officers. Yeah. I think what that was more referring to is this doesn't just impact um, some of our neighbourhood teams, this also impacts some of our um, uh, violence suppression unit of VSU officers mm -hmm. who've had um, some reductions too. So that that would be some of that work that they would pick up, the more proactive response to significant incidents. And yeah. I think that's what that was referring to. But around the engagement piece, um, absolutely, that is necessary, required and is an ongoing commitment. And we had a really positive meeting um, I'm losing track of weeks. Uh, I think it was last week, Joe, last Thursday evening. Um, at Wood Green Police Station with a number of community representatives at, with the um, head of task force in the Met who leads uh, TSG, DOGS, the Marine units um, amongst and kind of mounted branch um, and the BCU commander. And I think what came out really clearly from that is yes, the need for pre-briefing, but also the need for updates on the deployment. So actually at the end of a deployment, we we usually get a, an asset like that for one month. Actually, mm -hmm. the community wants an update actually around what yeah. the results were for that month and actually what that delivered on the borough and um, along with an update on any kind of issues that occurred or any kind of community complaints etc and we're more than happy to provide that so a really useful meeting and I think if you if you speak to anyone who was there I hope that 
that sentiment would be echoed by them. So that's something that we're committed to doing on an ongoing basis. And just to clarify, what we're not saying is that we'll plug the gaps of kind of neighbourhood offices with central resources. It's just that we do have in internal asset available should we really need to call on it. We do have enough people. Thank you. Thanks, Ron. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Ron. Dina, is that a question for you? I'm just conscious Thanks, of Sarah. time, so maybe we'll yeah, take be, Dina's last question. because I'll be, be very quick. I've, I've written to you, Jonathan, a number of occasions about this notion of much more collaborative working, which I hope, I do think in Haringey Ward, we have an opportunity because of the LCSP to do that. And we have some history of doing it. Um, Ian and myself and Andrew, you know, Rob, we did that for a long time in Green Lanes, working really hand in hand with the police. And I think the with is a really important preposition um, because I think the residents want to be have so much to offer. What I wanted to say was the consistency in the neighbourhood team is really important have, because they like, you know, they come and go. You said about the rotation. So it's always a bit like snakes and ladders. You know, you think you're up the ladder. Oh, God, you've got to go down, down the snake and start all over again um, because people don't have the local knowledge. Um, and I do think if you're talking about neighbourhood policing, local knowledge is is fundamental. The, the other point I'd make is that people complain that they do report, they report all the time. They report 101, 909, they try, but they never know what's, they're, they're not getting any, they don't often feel that their reporting goes anywhere. So in the neighbourhood policing, in a dialogue, because I think we need to be, have much more of a dialogue. And I have to say, it has really improved in my own ward. I do think that that is happening more. But you know, people will give you the information. They'll send the videos. They're doing all that. You know, and if, if people say, yes, we believe in neighbourhood policing, but then they want to see a sort of impact from it. And obviously there are things you're not going to tell us about what's going on. But I think the residents, they they get very, very, very frustrated that they don't feel they're they're being partnered. You know, we talk about partnering, but it's not partnering. So do you see what I mean? Absolutely. So if I would like to come back and answer that, Councillor, I think you're right. And I could double, triple, quadruple the ward officers um, for your ward and they would still be busy, if that makes sense. So there's plenty mm -hmm. of work um, to be done that side. I think communications and something I've um, we've definitely come on further, I think, um, more recently than we have been. We're definitely not there yet. Um, that communication to let people know what the police are doing to help reassure them. Um, it's got to be meaningful updates and it can't be around the bush, if that makes sense. It can't be just, you know, fluffy stuff. It's got to be, well, we are tackling this. Uh, we are having some challenges here. Um, you're right, the reporting bit um, paints a picture. Um, some of it we can respond to. It drives our resources. Um, and again, having officers with a bit more continuity will mean they can tackle some of those issues. And again, as I said, they're a small team. Uh, they're definitely delivering some really good stuff within um, Haringey Ward, and there's definitely more to be done. Uh, Joe and I are due to meet and get to round table the people um, to, to really work out that partnership working, because I think it's going to be uh, driven by uh, people, addresses, locations, uh, where that, where that um, drug supply is coming in, uh, which is really having a negative impact on, on those in the community, uh, particularly down the ladder. So no, thank you for your comments um, on that. I think we're definitely better where we were the year ago. Um, I won't settle for, for where we are now. Uh, more to do. Um, so thank you for your comments. Thank you. Good. OK. Well, look, shall we, are, we, um, are we happy to note that subject and you put your screen on? Uh, yes, no, I, I just wanted to jump in um, in advance of the next item when, at oh, yeah. the right time, but I have okay, no questions. Cool. Okay, very good. All right, well, look, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, and can we just note uh, item 10? Uh, right, serious violence duty, item 11. Do you want to come in before Joe speaks, Anne? Would you mind? And that's because sure. I need to give my apologies. I need to leave to chair another meeting shortly. I just wondered whether we would want to have uh, to acknowledge the report from um, Sir Mark Ro Ro Rowley that came out on Monday. In fact, no, got that wrong. It's um, Baroness Louise Casey's report yeah. um, mm. about the Met. Just to acknowledge it and to know what we will do in this room um, to 
uh, hear it and to know how it impacts Haringey and what assurances we might have from the police about those who are in office in Haringey. Of course, we won't have details, um, uh, you know, and of course we want to be sensitive, but it would be helpful to know that there aren't multiple people who are, you know, in, in challenging places um, without processes in place to be sure that where there is concern about behaviour that they're being addressed. I just thought I would raise it in, in this room. The answer could be that we just note the report and the rest is not for us to consider, but I wanted to raise it anyway. I hope that's okay. Thank yes, you. No, thank you, and that's uh, an, a very important point and and, uh, and one that uh, we didn't want this meeting to, to, to end without having at least acknowledged because it's so topical. Um, Joe, do you want to uh, speak? And then we yeah. can make sure we have those questions answered. Yeah. Um, and then you've got you've got to be out by what um, five minutes to in the next three minutes, presumably. Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. Or or maybe perhaps we should. Well, actually, Rona Jonathan, does someone here want to just acknowledge the point that uh, Anne mentioned? Perhaps while she's still here, rather than answering it once she's gone. Of course, absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm more than happy to, Anne. And I think it's a really Im important thing to acknowledge. Um, and I really appreciate your, all of your support, as I know you will and have already, in helping us um, really working through this really challenging time, um, in all honesty, for the Met as an organisation. What I, I would like to say is that I think internally, in the Met, there is a real feeling that yes, of course, the findings make difficult reading, but actually we wanted those to be published and we really want to address the failings right away. And I haven't spoken personally, and I know Jonathan um, and Marco will probably say the same thing. I, I personally have spoken to a lot of staff this week um, and colleagues and friends within the Met and no one has said anything but actually they have a real drive to actually want to see some change in the organisation. I think Sir Mark is really clear. And um, so his his kind of three pledges, if you like, is more trust, less crime and high standards. And it's been really clear right from the start that integrity and the highest standards around trust and confidence are absolutely going to be um, his commitment to the Met. And that's the legacy that he wants to see. So there's a number of things internally, um, I guess, just to, to kind of, set the scene that are happening at the moment. So Sir Mark's doing significant engagement internally and externally. So he visited Haringey and met with some of the people on this call, amongst others last week, um, and also staff engagement and speaking to some of our staff. Actually, just this afternoon, he held an all staff across the whole of the Met Q&A around the Baroness Casey report. And that is something that we're also doing locally. So we take this really seriously and we know there's a lot of work to do. What we really want to do at the moment is to make sure that we, in essence, have every single one of our staff who work locally in Haringey and Enfield have read the report, understand what it says and understand what part they have to play and really clearly understand the expectations of the organisation and what values we, we have to uphold. And um, so I absolutely think it's important to note its significance. I'm grateful to you for bringing it up. And um, I hope I answered your, your question. I know I haven't given any significant detail, but in all honesty, I don't really want to spend time covering off a lot of the central changes that will be happening, Anne, and I'm sure many uh, members will have seen on the news, Sir Mark's significant investment in the Department of Professional Standards, the review they're trying to look at around our misconduct and vetting and recruitment systems. What I'd really like to perhaps bring back to another meeting is what we're doing locally, because I yes. think that's what people would be most interested in. How our officers and staff feel locally, what our communication approach has been locally, what feedback we're getting locally, and actually how we can work with the communities to make sure um, that this is two way. One thing I would like to outline um, is, is some of the work that we are doing uh, with the Equalities um, Board in, in Haringey. And I think that's really important to note. So I know Lynette and, and Christine Andrew have been heavily involved in that, and I'm work trying to support them with that. And I think that, although feels slightly separate to this, is really linked into it. And I think people's experience of the Met internally and externally our, our culture internally has an impact on public treatment in essence and it's something I'm keen to work on. One thing I would like to try and do is to do something locally about community-led training for officers. So 
we do a lot around recruit trainings where community members share their experiences, their lived experiences of being policed or being a victim of crime or indeed being exploited and, and you know, um, undertaking criminal activity and the reasons why, really putting themselves in, in those individual shoes to sh gain a shared perspective and empathy. I'd like to do more of that locally with existing officers who aren't new recruits. And I do think that will have a significant impact in terms of culture. And um, I know it's slightly away from the misconduct element, but I do think it really taps into some of the key focuses in the report around discrimination, which I think are really important. And I think the public um, perception around that is just as important as the internal perception and both need to be tackled at the same time. Yeah, no. thank you very much for your response. And I was one of those who, who with others in the room, who met um, Sir Mark on Friday night. And yeah. um, I absolutely, um, his passion and his commitment and his dedication was very clear. And, 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 and I, and I'm sure others in the room, welcomed that. Um, I, I would say about the training, I, I think that it, it, the issue isn't, for me wholly about training and so oh, no, though I though I understand that that's that's needed what I see happens there is that people in the community keep giving and what we need really is just for people to adhere to the values that the Met have and if they can't to be you know uh, trained in 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 the values and the standards I think it's more about that I, I, I don't think it's that people don't understand what they're what they're doing you know Hence, why some things are in WhatsApp groups and out of sight. You know, we we appreciate that there's a culture change, and I certainly, for one, am supportive of that. And I do think it would be good to have a synopsis of the report at another meeting with what we're doing locally, because that's what's most important to us here. Thank you very much. I know this can't be easy for colleagues in the Met, um, but it is a journey, as they say, and and we're here helping as much as we can. Thank you. Thanks, Anne. And just to very briefly come back on that sorry chair absolutely welcome by us too i'd like to say and that's kind of really what i meant and just to be really clear i'm absolutely not talking about training people not to be racist or discriminatory in any way course, that course, is totally utterly i just want to be really clear on that because i know that's totally things understood. that how things have been perceived before i guess my point is there needs to be really clear expectations internally and we need to yeah. be really ruthless about rooting people out absolutely. if they fall short of that we're a public service and must uphold those values to have confidence yeah. and trust and legitimacy However, I do think there is an, a link um, around external treatment too. And I, I do want to try and work on the two together so we don't yeah, focus yeah. on one more than the other. Absolutely. Thank you ever so much. Thanks, thank Sam. you. And thank you, Chair, for letting me jump in ahead of the, uh, the queue, so to speak. My pleasure. I've got some casework, Anne, so you can return the favour when I give you a shout <laughs> later. <laughs> Definitely. Thank you. Take so, care, everyone. Thank, thank, thank you. Indeed. Bye now. Bye. Uh, OK, so, Joe, do you want to... Uh, briefly touch on things, and then we yeah. can um, we can. Yeah, so this, this uh, shouldn't take too long. I'm, I'm going to kind of whiz through this slide deck. I should say at the outset that we um, I had invited the uh, VIU to come along and present this. My screen just. Am I still? Can you still hear me? Yep, clearly. Oh, my screen's just frozen. Um, yeah, I did invite the uh, VIU to to come along and present this. Um, but unfortunately, um, they couldn't make it today and I've got a bit of a problem with my screen. So I've suddenly frozen. So I don't know if someone else can share the slide deck. Um, mine's not. Oh, hang on. I've, I'm, I'm moving. I'm there moving. We are. Okay. Uh, right. Cool. Uh, I'll just put this on presentation mode. I'm really just going to whip through this uh, as quickly as I can. And um, it's really to just to bring this to the board's attention. Um, the uh, violence reduction unit has um, been working with the Home Office to develop the London uh, serious, uh, well, to develop the framework around the London serious violence duty. This is an, a new national duty. Uh, it's been introduced uh, by the government and um, uh, through the uh, Police Crime Sentencing Call Act uh, 2022, as you can see there. The duty will commence, uh, well, the, this will be implemented, and I'll come on to that in a bit more detail, in early 2023. And as you can see there, the, the partnerships or the local partnerships uh, will have 12 months to finalise their violence uh, reduction strategy. I'm not going to go through all of these um, all of these uh, points here. I'll just move through the slide deck if that's all right. Try and get to the salient ones. In terms of the serious violence duty, this will be um, uh, the, response the responsibility of the services that you can see there. 
which includes the police, fire and rescue authorities, youth justice teams, etc., health bodies, local authorities, as well as the others uh, that are listed uh, in the in the uh, third paragraph there uh, uh, in terms of educational institutions, prisons and others. And I think one of the key points is the duty does not specify a lead organisation or person to coordinate activity or prescribe a structure within which specified authorities are expected to work. And it's really for the specified authorities to come together to decide on the, the appropriate lead and structure. Hence is uh, the reason I brought it here today. Um, some of the key aspects of the duty will be around data sharing, so better data sharing. I know that there are some concerns about um, uh, the withdrawal of um, MPS data, but there are a lot of other um, data sources that we can use. Uh, analysis, um, and that's kind of, um, you know, kind of problem orientated um, approaches and, and utilising a hotspot analysis, etc. Uh, developing a strategic needs assessment, which is one of the key uh, activities for next year, and then producing a strategy. Um, the guidance is broad, and for London, uh, as you can as you can imagine, we risk uh, lots of different approaches to the strategy and analysis, and and obviously the uh, strategic needs assessments might be in different formats, and there's risks of key aspects uh, missing or being inconsistent across London. So that's one of the concerns that the VIU has, and and are going to try and resolve. So so the plan for London is as as detailed on this slide. Uh, the VIU will lead in coordinating a consistent approach for London, and they'll do that through various means, forming task and finish groups, uh, of which I sit on and I know Sandy does as well. Um, and I'm not, I'll, I'll leave that slide on, on there for people to read, and it is also in your pack uh, at pages um, 49 to 60 for those that want to have a more detailed look. Um, this is really the bit that I've I've come to the community safety for uh, uh, partnership board for. So one of the this, some of the discussions that we've been having about was about who should lead on the partnerships locally, and the consensus across uh, London is that this the, the duty sits kind of seems to fit within the community safety uh, partnership kind of area. So the the uh, the i suppose the consensus is that um across london that we hold governance for this and statutory responsibility within the community safety partnership and obviously one of the asks today will be whether uh, the board um well my recommendations of the board would be that we that that that, that in in terms of our local uh, violence strategy that the governance is set but I'm, I'm you know obviously we are and the VIU are, are kind of keen to take uh, different views if that's if that's still necessary. But certainly, my recommendation would be that that uh, we we hold the duty within uh, the community safety partnership and governance pr uh, processes. I'm just going to quickly hand over to Sandy because this has been the bone of contention really uh, about what we define, what we would, what the definition of serious violence would be. Thanks, Joe. Um, so as, as Joe says, um, in terms of the, this this duty, it's likely to, to sit with community safety partnerships, and that looks like the the angle that the London VRU are, are taking on it. Um, and when we talk about violence, obviously there's lots of ways to define violence and lots of different categorizations within that. So not to get in, in too depth, but essentially it looks like when we talk about serious violence within this context, it will include some of the things you see on screen here. So it will include domestic abuse, sexual offending, uh, things like threats of violence, but it will exclude terrorism. Um, it'll also look at um, serious violence, such as public space youth violence as well. Um, there is a bit more nuance. And on the next slide, Joe, if you don't mind uh, flicking over to the next slide, please. There is, again, we're not going to get necessarily into the detail of this here, but there is there are some, some more detailed discussions taking place. Um, and Haringey, in fact, is one of the lead boroughs for London in terms of the discussions with the London VRU to really bottom out what the definition should be for violence that we look at within this duty. Um, so there are some nuances to that. And it's within your pack. So again, happy to, to take any comments on that going forward. As, as once again, we are working very closely with the London VRU to help shape the, the whole London wide uh, angle for this. Um, the next slide, if you don't mind, Joe, just looks at the strategy. Uh, essentially, uh, one of the requirements of the duty is for us to come up with a strategy. Um, and there are some, some guidance from the London VRU on what that should include. That will include uh, an assessment of the data, the analytics, which is something we, we will always do quite regularly within Harringay anyway. Uh, it will also look at how we're working together as a partnership to discharge our duty and essentially the requirements that we have underneath that, as well as a, a review annually um, and looking at how we're performing essentially for violence. Um, the next slide, Joe. 
Uh, that looks at uh, data access. So if we flick over to the next slide, please. Again, we don't need to look at this necessarily, but it just highlights that there is lots of data out there in order for, for us to assess how we're doing with violence. And once again, it has been recognised by the VRU that actually we're one of the London leading boroughs with regards to, to this aspect. Um, the final slide, Joe, just looks at next steps. So perhaps I'll hand back over to you for that. Yeah, no worries. Thanks, Sandy. Um, so, uh, so uh, as as I said earlier, the VRU are looking at a tiered approach to the uh, strategic needs assessment uh, to take into consideration local resourcing and local um, local areas of concern, for example. Um, so Sandeep was quite modest, actually. Sandeep has been really at the forefront of supporting the VRU uh, through uh, the London Partnership Analyst Group, which he chairs. And as you can see there, we've we've kind of you know the VRU has certainly recognised Sandeep's contribution to this. And uh, as effective practice, and how, and and, and obviously, um, has has given us credit for helping to shape the analytical process for London. Um, the uh, final uh, draft guidance document for London uh, should be with us by the end of this month, and uh, there are further task and finish groups uh, planned uh, in the coming weeks and months up until the end of the year. I propose that I bring this probably back to the Community Safety Partnership in at the well, December, January, Feb, March meeting, um, because it's at that point, it's likely that we'll have a lot more information in terms of uh, the home office funding around this, because there will be some funding as well. And also, um, yeah, just to kind of um, uh, uh, discuss the initial uh, strategic assessment and the timeline and plan for us uh, completing that in Harringay. So that's really it, Chair. It's just a quick whistle stop, but please do read through the, the presentation and, and up, you know, you're welcome to contact me directly uh, for any specific questions around this and I can obviously get some feedback from the VRU. Great. Thank you, Joe. Any thoughts, questions, reflections? Immediately? No? OK, well, people can, as Joe says, uh, uh, Zeno, are you wanting to speak or? No, no, I'm fine. No, I'm fine. OK. You just appeared on my screen twice the size of. <laughs> anyway, good. All right, look, super. Okay, well, we'll note that. And as Joe says, anyone's invited to raise uh, thoughts or concerns with him, they can do so directly. Yeah, right. Chair, can I just check that the the board agrees that that we hold the governance in the CSP going forward for for the duty, or would 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 you prefer to come back at a later date to whilst people consider? Um, I think we should come back, Joe. Um, okay, so I you. want to just also put that past the leader as well. Okay. Um, so, uh, and I didn't have a chance to do, um, to do so before today. So let's um, let's move that to December. That that okay. won't have a material impact on timelines, will it? Really? Not really. No, but okay. uh, there might right, be. Well, some, yeah, in terms of the um, uh, the youth, the youth justice, uh, not the youth justice, but the young people at risk um, uh, strategy and some of the work that they're doing. So there will be some crossover across other streets. OK, uh, well, uh, we can pick up with the leader afterwards and then if needs be, we can uh, speak to colleagues in, in, in between yep. um, now on December 13th. And if a urgent decision is required, then Carol and I can uh, convene the appropriate meeting. Um, right, thanks, Chair. In the short term. Good. OK, all right. So we'll note, we'll note item 11. Uh, item 12, any other business? No, other than I suspect everyone's ready for a cup of tea. Uh, Oh, my sorry, phone, I right. did, did have Hello, one Chantal. AOV. Go ahead. Oh, OK, so I'm just wanted to update the partnership that we will need to undertake a domestic homicide review. Um, very sadly, there was a male suicide earlier this year where domestic abuse was a factor um, and the case had been heard at the Marac in 2021. So therefore, it fits the... Um, Home Office criteria of a domestic homicide review. We've notified the Home Office and are currently in the process of hiring a chair. So just wanted to update the board on that. Thank you. That's very helpful, uh, Chantel. Obviously, a very sad circumstance. But um, you, but do you want to come in on this specifically, or have you got a separate ARB? It's a separate ARB chair. I just wanted to take opportunity to thank the team for presenting today. I know you were going to do that, but I thought I'd jump in before you. You guys all take my, I'm going to have to talk, I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to have to, and I will learn for the next meeting to hold we'll the get chairs. There first, Chair. Who are, also, yeah, so much for being respectful. Guess you know also, where. Also, a big thank you to uh, Jonathan, Marco, and, and Rona, and thank you everyone for contributing. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, he, you want to definitely earn this meeting. <laughs> Stop me going on. Okay, all right, well, uh, thank you, Chantel, for 
that AOB, and I know that um, uh, due processes will will uh, will take effect uh, as and when uh, necessary. Uh, any new items of urgent business, Nav? I don't believe there are. No, none. Good. Uh, I'll ignore the second call for any other business, um, <laughs> and we'll we'll go to uh, item fifteen uh, for dates of future meetings. Uh, and I believe the next one is the 13th of December at 11 a.m. Yes. Uh, but as I said earlier, apologies for me because I'm getting married at noon. So I won't be with you all, but I will be with you in spirit. And I know Caroline will uh, uh, be, uh, um, you'll be in safe hands with Caroline. Good. Okay, everyone. Well, thank you very much. Uh, my throat, as I say, is running dry after two hours. So I'm going to go <laughs> have a cup of tea. So I expect everyone else will want to as well. Um, and uh, as Yuva says, um, at least it shows we're all on message that we know what we're going to do uh, and do the same thing. Uh, thanks to everyone for, for contributing uh, to the discussions. Um, <laughs> you, but we're getting married at noon and George me in house, so pop downstairs. We're not far. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's actually cabinet day, so Alison's going to get mad when all the cabinets turn up for the photos. Anyway, all right. Uh, <laughs> thanks, everybody, and uh, we'll see, see you um, all at the next meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Bye now.